It's a November night in 1967. American fighter pilots Lance Saijan and John Armstrong soar through the skies of Laos in a McDonnell Douglas F-4C, Saijan in the back seat. Their target? An enemy position near Ban Le Boy Ford, a vital river crossing on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The F-4C rolls and the pilots prepare to rain hell on the North Vietnamese. One moment, the mission is go. The next, the F-4C erupts in a ball of fire, flash banging the pilots and illuminating the night like lightning. Black smoke clogs the cockpit and the aircraft tumbles through the air. Choking, Saijan manages to eject while no one will ever see John Armstrong again. Saijan's parachute catches him, though he's still descending on the jungle at great speed as unconsciousness takes him. Lance Peter Saijan was born on the 13th of April, 1942, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Of Serbian heritage, Saijan was also known by his Serbian name, Lazar Saijan. His parents were Sylvester and Jane, and he was the first of three children. In 1960, Saijan graduated from high school and signed up for a Naval Academy Preparatory School in Maryland. With that out of the way, he attended the US Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, where he dominated his studies and the football field. Saijan's roommate, Mike Smith, later referred to Saijan as probably the toughest guy mentally that he'd ever met, and also described Saijan as a big, handsome guy with a good sense of humor who had no trouble getting dates. One of Saijan's teachers had the following to say about Saijan. He had the crusty facade of a football player, yet he was very sensitive. He was very persistent and not satisfied with doing just any kind of job. He wanted to do it right and showed a real tenacity to stick to a problem. In 1965, while the war raged in Vietnam, Saijan graduated with a degree in humanities and a second lieutenant's commission. He then completed an undergraduate pilot training course, after which he was assigned to the 480th Tactical Fighter Squadron of the USAF's 366th Fighter Wing, a unit stationed at Da Nang Air Base. Before Saijan left for South Vietnam, he met with Smith, who later said, I sensed a foreboding in him. I felt he had a premonition that he might not return. While the specifics of what Saijan got up to between landing in Vietnam and that night in November 1967 are unclear, we know that his bombing run with John Armstrong was his 52nd combat mission, so he was definitely sticking it to the enemy throughout that time. Now though, he's about to wake up. When consciousness creeps back in, the first thing Saijan registers is that he's no longer falling. The second thing is the pain. God, like nothing he's known before. Bone protrudes from his left leg. Three fingers on his right hand are mangled, bent back towards his wrist. His head throbs, his skull split upon impact. Dried blood cakes his hair and face. A military man and survivor, Saijan locks the pain away in a box inside his mind and evaluates how screwed he really is. Well, he can't be that screwed because he has on his person a radio, right? It's surely only a matter of time before the search and rescue guys come and he can make contact. While that checks out in theory, and while Saijan will make contact with the search and rescue guys, what he doesn't know is that he's never going home and the pain is only just getting started. On the night of November 9th, 1967, Saijan's parachute landed him without grace upon a limestone ridge near Ban Le Boy Ford and behind enemy lines. Over the rest of that night, all of the 10th and the morning of the 11th, US search and rescue forces in the area heard not a peep out of Saijan. Later, on the 11th, he made radio contact and they launched a massive search and rescue operation with over 120 aircraft participating. But this was no walk in the park. Enemy AA fire erupted from the jungle, battering at least 20 aircraft so badly that they had to retreat. At least one aircraft was shot down. Despite this, 
a jolly green giant helicopter managed to get through. The chopper hovered over the jungle in Saijan's vicinity for more than 30 minutes, during which time Saijan made no further radio contact. Taking small arms fire, the helicopter withdrew, and with it, the rest of the search and rescue force. Saijan was recorded as MIA. Utterly alone now, Saijan knew that he was his own best bet. He had to move, or he'd die of thirst, or get eaten alive by the jungle. His cracked skull and mangled right hand were one thing, but his compound fracture was another. To move, Saijan had to crawl backwards on his elbows, dragging his bum over the ground. He had no food and could source only small quantities of dirty water. To top this off, his enemies were all around him. Yet, over the next 46 days, he endured, covering as much ground as he could and pushing his crippled body beyond human limits. On that 46th day, Saijan made it to a truck road on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, at which point he couldn't drag himself any longer. The flesh of his buttocks had worn through to the bone. He lay there, ruined for a whole day, after which the North Vietnamese came and peeled him from the ground. Saijan's captors threw him into a bamboo cell in the same holding point as two other recently captured Americans, Guy Gruters and Bob Craner. The Vietnamese fed Saijan, but only so he could grow strong enough for them to interrogate him. This was a mistake. When a guard came within striking range of Saijan, Saijan karate chopped him in the neck, knocking him unconscious, then gave it legs. Unfortunately, Saijan's flight into the jungle lasted only a few hours, after which the Vietnamese caught him and chained him up in his cell again. Grutas and Craner could hear what the guards did to Saijan from down the hall. As Craner put it, the guard would say, Your arm, your arm, it is very bad. I am going to twist it unless you tell me. And Saijan would say, I am not going to tell you. It's against the code. And then he would start screaming. The guard was obviously twisting his mangled arm. Saijan just wouldn't give in. He'd say, wait till I get better, you SOB. You're really going to get it. He was giving the guard all kinds of lip, but no information. Later, Grutas and Craner had to help move Saijan from his cell and into a truck for transportation to a facility in Hanoi. Craner retched when he saw Saijan up close. In Craner's words, he was so thin and every bone in his body was visible. Maybe 20% of his body wasn't open sores or open flesh. Both hip bones were exposed where the flesh had been worn away. Upon eye contact with Grutas, Saijan said, You're Guy Grutas, aren't you? We were at the academy together. Don't you know me? I'm Lance Saijan. Saijan was so emaciated that Grutas hadn't even recognized him. Grutas recalled that he had never had his heart broken like that. Despite his condition, and despite the drive to Hanoi almost killing him, Saijan never complained and spoke only of the trio's next move, of escape. As with our boy Rocky Versace, Saijan refused to break the US code of conduct upon interrogation and torture. His will was indomitable. Unfortunately, his immune system was not. Kept in a dark cell with a wet cement floor in Hoa Loi prison, Saijan contracted pneumonia and fell into delirium. In his final days, Saijan used the last of his strength, crying out, Oh my God, it's over. And, Dad, where are you? Death claimed him on the 22nd of January, 1968. Saijan was just 25 years old. For his bravery and unwavering loyalty, Saijan received a posthumous Medal of Honor, but what his father said hits a little harder than the citation. A person never knows how competitive he really is until he comes up against the ultimate situation. My son could have been less courageous. He could have retreated into the ranks of the North Vietnamese and said, here I am, take care of me. But he chose to go the other way. He probably never doubted that somehow, somewhere, he'd get out. 
Had you heard of Lance Peter Saijan before today though? Do you know anything about him that we didn't cover in this video? Do you think you can endure 46 days in the jungle with a compound fracture? And lastly, do you think Saijan would have survived if he'd given the Vietnamese the information they wanted? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below. It's an autumn night in North Korea. The year is 1950. The 19th Infantry Regiment of the US Army's 24th Infantry Division holds its position upon Hill 123 near Chongchong River. An American corporal named Red Cloud mans a forward listening post, a foxhole among the trees, not too far from the rest of his company. Tucked into his shoulder is an M1918 BAR and beside him is just one other man. Somewhere, a stick breaks. The hairs on the back of Red Cloud's neck stand up. He peers into the night, sees a shadow move from tree to tree. Red Cloud doesn't waste a moment. He aligns the sights of the automatic rifle and fires. We return to the 1950s to tell a tale of heroism and berserker-like tenacity from the Korean War. Let's jump right into it. Mitchell Red Cloud Jr. was born in Wisconsin in 1925 to a family of ethnic Ho-Chunk Native Americans, and his father was a chief. Red Cloud went to Black River Falls High School, where many students were eager to join the US Armed Forces as soon as they came of age. Red Cloud was no different. In 1941, he dropped out and enlisted in the Marine Corps. At this point, the Second World War was raging in Europe, but the Japanese Empire had yet to bomb Pearl Harbor and goad the United States into the conflict. By April, Red Cloud was a member of the Marine Raider Battalion, Carlson's Raiders, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Evans Carlson. Under Carlson, Red Cloud served in the Guadalcanal Campaign in 1942, landing in Aola Bay on the Solomon Island of Guadalcanal on the 4th of November 1942. After the landing, he participated in an operation known as the Long Patrol, where the Marine Raiders engaged the numerically superior forces of Toshinari Shoji in Guadalcanal's hinterland. Striking from the jungle, Carlson's men slew some 500 Japanese soldiers, while starvation and disease claimed hundreds more. Disease tried to take Red Cloud as well, causing him to lose some 34 kilograms or 75 pounds, but he held doggedly on until the Corps sent him to recover in America in February 1943. Here, Red Cloud was offered a medical discharge. He refused, and after he had recovered, he rejoined the Marines for the Allied invasion of the Japanese island Okinawa in April 1945. During the invasion, Red Cloud took a bullet to the shoulder and was evacuated to the island of Guam. Later, his unit, the 29th Marine Regiment of the 6th Marine Division, joined Red Cloud here. From Guam, the Marines prepared for Operation Downfall, the next phase of the Allied invasion of Japan. Before this invasion could take place, however, the US nuked Japan forcing the nation's surrender. Red Cloud, now a sergeant, was discharged from the Corps in November. Back in the US, Red Cloud studied and wrote about Native American history for a time, got married, and had a daughter. By 1948, however, he was itching to get back into his combat boots, so he signed up for the US Army, serving in E Company of the 2nd Battalion, 19th Infantry Regiment, 24th Infantry Division. While Imperial Japan had been defeated, the Allies couldn't simply let the former Axis nation be, so they occupied Japan from 1945 to 1952. Red Cloud's unit participated in said occupation, operating on the island of Kyushu. In 1950, however, before the occupation came to an end, war erupted in neighboring Korea. Being so close to the action, Red Cloud's unit was shipped in to contest North Korea's invasion of the South. One of his first battles was fought at Taejeon in South Korea. Here, US and South Korean troops, united as a UN force, 
defended the HQ of the US 24th Infantry Division against as many as 20,000 North Korean infantrymen and 50 tanks. The UN troops fought a bloody urban battle in Taejeon, but ultimately they could not hold the city and were forced to withdraw, with the US commander William F. Dean falling into the hands of the enemy. Red Cloud lived and escaped to fight another day. That other day was the Battle of the Pusan Perimeter, waged from the 4th of August to the 18th of September in the city of Pusan. Here, some 140,000 exhausted UN troops stood their ground against an invasion force of 98,000 soldiers of the Korean People's Army, or KPA, staving them off for six whole weeks. Resupplied by the city's port and maintaining naval and air superiority throughout the battle, the UN forces ultimately came out on top. This time, it was the North Koreans who withdrew. Red Cloud saw almost non-stop battle throughout that campaign, and in late September, UN forces returned to South Korea's capital, Seoul, and recaptured it from the KPA. Red Cloud's regiment was one of the units tasked with giving chase to the North Koreans as they fled north. If the UN troops used their momentum, they could push deep into the north, defeat the KPA, and reunify the north and south. That was the plan, anyway. But to the north, an emerging world power was stirring, and the UN forces ran straight into a communist Chinese surprise attack. It was during the People's Republic of China's first phase offensive that Red Cloud found himself upon Hill 123 that autumn night, with only his BAR and his adrenaline between him and the advancing Chinese troops. Red Cloud's BAR spits out three rounds, and the shadow drops out of sight. Another emerges, two more, three. Bullets whip past Red Cloud's head. One catches his comrade in his throat. He collapses in the foxhole, blood spurting between his fingers. Red Cloud holds down the trigger, sweeping automatic fire through the enemy ranks. Three shadows go down, only to be replaced by a further dozen. The base of the hill comes to life. They are everywhere, emerging from the bushes and the trees, spitting small arms fire at Red Cloud's position. He ducks in his foxhole, where his comrade gurgles out his last breath and reloads the BAR. Standing, he pumps lead into the advancing Chinese at point-blank range. Something slams into his chest. He stumbles against the far side of the foxhole, just in time to see the rest of his company take up defensive positions beside him, putting the hurt on the Chinese. Red Cloud's world rings. The shouts of fighting and dying men come through muffled. A medic descends into the foxhole, pointing at the blood welling from Red Cloud's chest, but he refuses medical aid, clambering out of the foxhole to continue the fight. When another bullet punches into him, he leans against a tree and lets loose with the BAR, cutting down man after man. Two more bullets sink into Red Cloud's flesh, shattering his bones. He feels nothing, his veins jam-packed with adrenaline, but his body is shutting down. Hardly able to stand anymore, he has his comrades fasten him to his tree with a web belt, and then he tells them to withdraw with the companies wounded while he holds the enemy off. The last thing Red Cloud's comrades see of him is his BAR's muzzle flash lighting up the night. While Red Cloud held his ground to his final bullet and final breath, one man cannot stand against an army forever. The Chinese ultimately gunned him down and overwhelmed Hill 123. Though if Red Cloud hadn't done what he did, it's likely the Chinese would have gotten the jump on his unit and obliterated it. His sacrifice allowed his comrades to live and fight another day, and they ultimately regrouped to put a stop to the Chinese offensive, returning the next morning to claim the body of the hero to whom they owed their lives. Red Cloud's body was completely surrounded by dead Chinese troops. For his actions, General of the Army Omar Bradley awarded Red Cloud the Medal of Honor, presenting it to his mother in April the following year. 
A portion of the citation reads as follows. Springing up, he delivered devastating point-blank automatic rifle fire into the advancing enemy. With utter fearlessness, he maintained his firing position until severely wounded by enemy fire. This heroic act stopped the enemy from overrunning his company's position and gained time for reorganization and evacuation of the wounded. Corporal Red Cloud's dauntless courage and gallant self-sacrifice reflects the highest credit upon himself and upholds the esteemed traditions of the US Army. But had you heard of the Native American who gave his life for his comrades and country in the Korean War? Do you know anything about him that we didn't cover in this video? Can you think of any other heroes with Native American heritage you'd like us to cover here on The Braved? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below. It's the 29th of October 1963. Several companies of the Vietnamese Civilian Irregular Defense Force or CIDF, accompanied by a number of Americans, are caught in a Viet Cong ambush in Vietnam's Thoi Binh district, beside the dreaded U Minh forest. Among the Americans is Captain Humbert Rock Versace, nicknamed Rocky. He takes cover in a ditch alongside one Lieutenant James Nicholas Rowe, one Sergeant Dan Pitzer, and a number of CIDF troops who've thrown down their guns and are ready to surrender to the numerically superior VC force. One of the troops even holds a grenade to his own chest, less afraid of death than falling into enemy hands. Mortars blast craters into the earth and send limbs tumbling through the air. There's a non-stop hail of automatic fire. The three Americans in the ditch get the CIDF troops up and moving, covering their retreat with M1 carbines and an M79 grenade launcher. The sound of a BAR crashes in on their position, the bullets flipping Rocky from his feet right before a grenade can explode in his face. We return to the Vietnam War to tell the tale of Humbert Rock Rocky Versace, the first soldier of the US Army to receive the Medal of Honor for heroic actions as a POW in Vietnam. You know the drill by now, let's get stuck into it. Rocky was born in Honolulu, Hawaii on the 2nd of July 1937, the eldest of five children of Puerto Rican Italian descent. Raised a Catholic, he grew up in Alexandria, Virginia and attended a school in Germany for a time. After high school, Rocky signed up for West Point where his father had been a cadet before him. Rocky graduated in 1959 and became a second lieutenant of armor in the US Army. That same year, he went to Ranger School, earning his Ranger tab in December. But that didn't sate Rocky's ambition. As soon as he'd graduated from Ranger School, he went to Airborne School and scored his parachutist badge, after which he served as a tank platoon leader in Korea until April 1961. It was only natural that Rocky wanted to get involved in the Vietnam War too. Completing an intelligence course at Fort Holabird, Maryland, and a course in Vietnamese, Rocky volunteered to go to Vietnam as an intelligence advisor, arriving in May 1962. While in Vietnam, however, a path other than the military presented itself to Rocky. In May 1963, he extended his tour by six months so that he could become a priest and work as a missionary to improve the lives of orphans in Southeast Asia. In the final two weeks of his tour, after which he would have been free to pursue his new dream, he found himself by the Umin Forest, which Roe later described as a vast darkness, and Pitsa, the dreaded legendary forest sanctuary of the Viet Cong. Working with these three Americans, the CIDF companies tried to bait the VC into an ambush on the 29th of October 1963, but the VC fled into an unexpected direction, forcing the Americans and South Vietnamese into an ambush the VC had prepared. Roe described the ensuing battle in detail. I never saw so many VC in my life. They must have had at least three platoons coming across that paddy and they just kept coming. I had an M1 battle sighted for 300 yards and I was doing good work with it across those paddies. Dan Pitzer caught the first bunch with the M79. When the first guy got it in the chest, he all but disappeared and the sight stopped the squad cold. They had never seen the M79 before and the shock of the weapon's power gave us time to get out of there. As you saw earlier, the Americans fought tooth and nail to cover the withdrawal of the CIDF, with a grenade exploding right in front of our boy Rocky, right now. The world is ringing, the screams and shouts of dying men coming through muffled as if Rocky were underwater. 
Lieutenant Rowe is at his side in an instant, shrapnel sticking out of his face. Despite his wounds, Rowe drags Rocky to his feet and the two men limp desperately for safety among the reeds. With 700 rounds left in his carbine, Rocky wants to turn back and make each of them count, but Rowe is the voice of reason. He points to the bullet and shrapnel wounds in Rocky's leg and says, you're pumping like a fire hydrant. You'll bleed to death before you can pull the trigger. Gaining relative safety among the reeds, Rowe stems Rocky's bleeding with a compression wrap. As Rowe is applying a second wrap, the reeds part and the VC are upon them with Mohsen Nagants and an American carbine. Zotailen, hands up. That was really just the beginning of Rocky, Rowe and Pitz's troubles. In Rowe's words, the VC tied my arms with a big VC flag that I had in my pocket. They booted me down the path and when we passed the ditch our people had been in, I saw our wounded and dead. The VC were stripping the bodies of uniforms. The VC took all three of the men alive, moving them to a thatch and bamboo prison camp in the middle of the Umin forest. If it wasn't for Rocky's attitude during the men's imprisonment, it's likely all three of them would have perished. Recognizing Rocky as the highest ranking among the three, the VC directed their interrogation upon him. But all they would get from this man was a hard time. His captors wanted to break his spirits, make him accept their propaganda and extract vital information from him, but Rocky just cited lines from the Geneva Convention pertaining to the treatment of POWs over and over again, stating that he didn't have to give them anything more than his name, rank, service number and date of birth. He told his captors he would die before he compromised the US code of conduct and he denied their promises of food and better treatment on a regular basis. According to Pizza, Rocky told them to go to hell in Vietnamese, French and English. He got a lot of pressure and torture, but he held his path. As a West Point grad, it was duty, honor, country. There was no other way. Rocky also tried to escape on four separate occasions despite his wounded leg. Recognizing Rocky as a troublemaker, his captors locked him in a tiny bamboo cage, shackled him by his hands and feet to the ground, and put him on a starvation diet of rice and salt. They also let Rocky's wounded leg fester and tugged on it as a method of torture. At times, they shackled Roe in a similar manner. In the lieutenant's words, my arms were being pulled back and downward while my feet and legs were stretched in the opposite direction. It was like being on a rack. Despite this, Rocky maintained his fellow POW's morale by writing encouraging messages on the latrine walls and singing popular songs. The VC responded by gagging him, but whenever that gag came out, Rocky would sing as loud as he could. Indeed, the last thing the other POWs ever heard from Rocky was him singing God Bless America from the top of his lungs in his isolation box. After two years of this, that's right, two years, the VC came to terms with the fact that nothing would ever break Rocky's spirits. They executed him on the 26th of September 1965. His remains have yet to be recovered and likely never will. If it wasn't for Rocky drawing the wrath of his captors toward himself, Rowan Pitzer might never have survived. Still, Pitzer ultimately didn't gain his freedom until November 1967, while Rowe remained a POW until he made a daring escape in December 1968. As for Rocky's Medal of Honor, he was nominated for it in 1969 posthumously, but denied. After that, Rowe fought for Rocky's medal and spread Rocky's story until Rowe was killed in the Philippines in 1989. Word of Rocky's bravery and sacrifice went quiet for the next 10 years, but in 1999, some men from Rocky's former school formed the organization, the Friends of Rocky Versace. Gaining support, the Friends ultimately righted the wrong that had occurred way back in 1969. On the 8th of July 2002, President Bush finally awarded Rocky the Medal of Honor he always deserved. But we'd love to know what you think. Had you heard of Captain Humbert Rock Rocky Versace before today? Do you know anything about him we didn't cover in this video? And lastly, are there any other heroes from the Vietnam War you'd like us to cover on this channel? Please feel free to let us know all that and more in the comment section below. If you're familiar with our Big Brother channel, The Front, or war in general, you'd know that innocence is the first casualty of war. War brings out the worst in all of us, but it can also bring out the best. It's one thing to take a stand against an atrocity committed by your enemy, 
but another thing entirely if the perpetrators are your own men. During the Vietnam War, one American soldier stood up for what was right, lessening the death toll in what came to be known as the Mealy Massacre. Hugh Clowers Thompson Jr. was born in Georgia in 1943 during the Second World War and his father served in the US Navy. In his youth, Thompson was a member of the Boy Scouts and his mother and father raised him to respect people of all ethnicities. While Thompson was in high school, people were fighting and dying in the early stages of the Vietnam War. After graduating high school, Thompson signed up for the Navy and served in a mobile construction battalion in Georgia. Just two years later, in 1963, he got married, a man of only 20. The following year, Thompson was already ready to settle down. He left the Navy to start a family with his wife. A couple of years after that, Lyndon B. Johnson ordered the deployment of combat units in Vietnam. Thompson's older brother Thomas served in the conflict, and this certainly would have influenced Thompson's decision to give up the quiet life for war. He enlisted in the US Army in 1966 and completed the Warren Officer Flight program during that year and the next. In December 1967, he went to Vietnam with the 123rd Aviation Battalion of the US 23rd Infantry Division. Just a few months later, he witnessed hell. Early in 1968, the 48th Local Force Battalion of the Viet Cong Forces had made a series of attacks on American forces in Vietnam's Quang Ngai province. Following that, US intel suggested that the villages of Son Me were harboring the VC unit. Mille was one of the hamlets inside the village. The Americans, in short, intended to find and eradicate the 48th Battalion. A battalion-sized task force of the 11th Brigade of the US 23rd Infantry Division, Thompson's division, was charged with this objective. Thompson's job was to fly recon in his OH-23 Raven helicopter. The man in charge of the task force was Frank Barker. Before the attack went down, this man ordered his officers to burn houses, destroy the food supplies, kill the livestock and poison the wells. Within Task Force Barker was Charlie Company, commanded by one Captain Ernest Medina. Some later accounts of the event that transpired stated that Medina said the following to his men. They're all VC. Now, go and get them. He told them that anyone running or hiding from them was the enemy. Anything walking, crawling or growling was the enemy. Vernado Simpson of C Company reinforced this narrative. We were told to leave nothing standing. We did what we were told, regardless of whether they were civilian. Early in the morning of the 16th of March 1968, US forces shelled Son Me and then the ground elements of the task force entered the village. What they found wasn't the 48th VC Battalion, but rather Vietnamese civilians preparing for a market day. Seeing the Americans, the villagers took shelter in groups, which made it even easier for the soldiers to carry out their orders. They fired on livestock, old men and women and children alike. They set fire to the huts and raped not only the women, but young girls too. According to one Michael Bernhardt, I saw them shoot an M79 grenade launcher into a group of people who were still alive. But it was done mostly with a machine gun. They were shooting women and children just like anybody else. We met no resistance and I only saw three captured weapons. We had no casualties. C Company's 1st Platoon, led by William Kelly, rounded up between 70 and 80 villages in an irrigation ditch and massacred them with bayonets, bullets and grenades. Meanwhile, Thompson was in the air and beginning to put the picture together. The bodies he was seeing weren't just casualties of the earlier shelling. He radioed the following message to the task force's HQ. It looks to me like there's an awful lot of unnecessary killing going on down there. There's bodies everywhere. There's a ditch full of bodies. He also saw Captain Medina kick and then shoot a Vietnamese woman he, Thompson, had earlier marked with green smoke for medevac. Not one to stand on the sidelines and simply watch an atrocity, Thompson brought the helicopter down by Kelly and his ditch of civilian bodies. When Thompson asked his superior what was going on and why he was massacring unarmed civilians, Kelly told him that he was in charge and that Thompson should mind his own business. One of Kelly's men then fired into the ditch, finishing some of the still moving victims. With that, Thompson took off and with his crew, started searching for civilians to rescue. Among other things, he intercepted some men from the 2nd platoon chasing down some 12 to 16 civilians who had fled into a bunker. Landing the helicopter, Thompson ordered his crew to fire on the American platoon if they tried to shoot the civilians while he attempted to bring them to safety. 
Covered by his crew, Thompson then persuaded the civilians to follow him into a pair of Hueys he had organized to evacuate them from hell. After refueling the helicopter at a nearby airstrip, Thompson returned and got back to work, ordering one of his men to extricate a living four-year-old girl from a pile of corpses in the ditch. Unable to do much more on the ground, Thompson flew the child to a hospital and then went to his HQ to report the massacre in person. Moved by Thompson's speech, Frank Barker subsequently called off the attack and Thompson flew back to the village to ensure Barker's orders were being taken seriously and that the wounded were receiving medical attention. According to Vietnamese estimates, 504 civilians were massacred by the Americans that day. Thompson only wished he could have saved more of them. For his bravery, Thompson was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, but he tossed the medal because the citation quoted intense crossfire, of which there was none. As you might have expected, the higher ups were trying to downplay and cover up the entire affair to spin it as an intense firefight between American and Viet Cong troops. When the massacre became public knowledge in late 1969, some US congressmen deemed Thompson a traitor and some members of the public bought into that lie. Back at home, he received death threats and people dumped mutilated dead animals on his doorstep too. With all this going on, he largely avoided the public eye, but stayed in the military until 1983, training other pilots and retiring at the rank of major. It wasn't until 1998, 30 years after the massacre, that Thompson got the military recognition he deserved, awarded the Soldier's Medal for distinguishing himself via an act of heroism not involving conflict with an enemy. A portion of the citation read, for heroism above and beyond the call of duty, while saving the lives of at least 10 Vietnamese civilians during the unlawful massacre of non-combatants by American forces. Warren Officer Thompson's heroism exemplifies the highest standards of personal courage and ethical conduct. Thompson succumbed to cancer in 2006 at 62 years of age. This was an especially heavy episode, but we'd still love to know what you think. Had you heard of Hugh Thompson before today? Do you know anything about him that we didn't cover in this video? And lastly, what do you think you would have done in his situation? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. It's the 19th of February, 1968. A platoon of the United States 101st Airborne Division 2nd Brigade advances through a rice paddy near Quang Trai in South Vietnam. The sky is black and the rain ceaseless. The platoon sergeant, Jorge Otero spots movement in a hedgerow ahead not a second before it erupts with enemy fire. RPGs whistle and explode. Mud and shrapnel spit into the sky. Beside Otero Barreto, the platoon's machine gunner and the machine gunner's assistant go down. The Viet Cong's assault doesn't let up and the American platoon is falling apart. Otero Barreto doesn't hesitate. He picks up the massive gun, aims it in the general direction of the enemy, and holds down the trigger. The barrel smokes as the gun eats through the belt. An RPG explodes right next to Otero Barreto, the shrapnel sinking into his flesh. Still standing, still spitting lead, he orders his men to retreat while he draws the Viet Cong's fire. They obey his command, and when the belts all chewed up, Otero Barreto switches to his rifle. Despite the immense size of his balls, the enemy can't seem to hit him. Having successfully covered his platoon's withdrawal, he joins them and lives to fight another day. We delve into the tale of the so-called Puerto Rican Rambo, focusing on the actions which earned him his two silver stars among a total of 38 military decorations. Let's get stuck into it. Jorge Otero Barreto was born in Vega, Baja, Puerto Rico in 1937 and was named after his father's idol, George Washington. He was the first of his parents' six children and they wanted him to become a doctor when he grew up. As Otero Barreto put it though, fate had its own way. After studying biology at university for a couple of years, he signed up for the US Army in 1959. After completing his basic training, he fell in with the 82nd Airborne Division and then the 101st. In his words, we were prepared to do whatever we had to do against the enemy. He was in Vietnam by 1961, tasked with turning local farmers into warriors. He also served as a platoon sergeant for US troops and was tough, but well loved. Otto Breda said it better than anyone. I was willing to kill. I was willing to die. I am still willing to take a cyanide pill instead of being a squealer. 
Veteran John Hay, who served under Otto Obreto, spoke highly of him too. Jorge was friendly, but he was all business. I trusted him with my life. The troops loved him. On one occasion, Otto Obreto's platoon had been pinned down by an enemy machine gun. Otto Obreto ordered one of his men to take the machine gunner out, giving the men some very clear-cut instructions. Before sending the man off, he said, If you don't obey orders from me, you're a dead dog. You'll never make it. Of the 200 combat missions Otto Obreto participated in from 1961 to 1970, the actions which earned him his silver stars seem to be the most famous. We've already covered his February 19th, 1968 heroics, where he rained hell on the Viet Cong with a machine gun, but what about his second silver star? The award-winning action took place just 74 days later in Wei. Let's see how it went down. Otto Robredo's platoon, along with the rest of Company A, occupied defensive positions near a village in Wei, South Vietnam, trapping the 8th Battalion of the 90th Regiment of the North Vietnamese Army inside the village. The 8th Battalion has been there for two days, subjected to air and artillery strikes, and they're getting frustrated. At 4 in the morning, they try twice to escape the death trap that is the village, and twice, Otto Robredo's platoon sends them running back with their tails between their legs. With those two assaults, the 8th is running low on men. Many lie dead or wounded on the ground. Otto Obredo seizes the initiative, leading his platoon into the village. RPGs, grenades, small arms fire are their welcoming party, coming from a number of bunkers and spider holes. Otto Obredo rushes ahead of his platoon, drawing fire, and then bursts into an enemy machine gun emplacement. The three troops occupying the emplacement are dead before they know what hit them. A squad from his platoon advances to his position, and following Otto Robredo, the squad moves from enemy position to enemy position, clearing them and using them as cover to fire on other enemy positions. Methodically, Otto Robredo gains control of the village, eradicating a numerically superior force and cementing his nickname, the Puerto Rican Rambo. In 1970, after nine years of fighting, Otto Robredo left Vietnam and active service in the US Army. He was among 48,000 Puerto Ricans who served in the US military throughout that conflict, and the most decorated. With that said, many other Puerto Ricans served with distinction and were awarded for it, with five Puerto Ricans earning the Medal of Honor, three the Navy Cross, and six the Distinguished Service Cross. In Otto Obrero's words, American history cannot be written without Hispanic soldiers. They went beyond the call of duty. Unfortunately, some Americans didn't seem to comprehend this. When Otto Obrero touched down in America on the 15th of December 1970, many rejected him, spat on him. They were looking at me like I was a monkey, he said. As another example, upon returning to California, veteran Jose Rodriguez recalled being jeered, booed, and having tomatoes thrown at him by protesters. Otto Obrero kept his cool in the face of all that though. His logic was as follows. When I was in the jungle, I didn't fight the enemy when they wanted to fight me. I fought them when I wanted to fight them. The same principle applied. Despite keeping his cool in the above situation, Otto Obrero had a tough time melding back into civilian life. He claimed he hated the US Army, his neighbors, his family, and himself. He felt like a coward because he quit the military, and his mood put a massive strain on his marriage. Once, he tried exchanging one of his war medals for a coffee, but was refused. The vendor said his medal wasn't worth anything. Otto Obrero got real low and threw all of his medals in the bin. If his neighbor hadn't been watching and hadn't retrieved them, the medals would have been lost to Otto Obrero forever. They eventually came back into his possession. He got even more pissed off when his wife threw away all of his guns, fearing he might use them to express his anger. Otto Obrero tried to find something to occupy himself with, somewhere to channel his energy. He finished his biology degree, but it didn't seem to give him what he was after. Then he got involved in the community, teaching children at a nearby school to box and creating youth programs. He credits these activities, as opposed to the pills, as being his cure. While he may have hated the army, Otto Obrero understood better than most the struggles of returning veterans. As such, he put his mind to helping veterans assimilate back into civilian life and receive veteran affair benefits in situations where they otherwise may not have. He also worked as a service officer and then a service commander at Post 14 in Vega, Baja. 
According to Ildefonso Colon Jr., in the veteran community, we know and honor this man because we know what he has done and what he continues to do. As for Otto Obredo, who is now 84 years old, he doesn't want to be remembered solely as the Puerto Rican Rambo, but as a good man. A good grandpa, he said. A good father, a good husband. I want them to remember me. To him, the best Rambo was in his gut. To quote Otto Obredo one final time, that Rambo saved my life in Vietnam, took care of me in Vietnam. He told me when to fight, when not to fight, when to push, when to withdraw, when to kill. As always, we'd love to know what you think. Had you heard of the Puerto Rican Rambo before today? Can you think of any other brave Puerto Ricans who fought in the Vietnam War, or any other war for that matter? How do you think you would react if you came home from war only to get booed and spat on? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. It's 1pm on the 18th of August 1966. Delta Company of the 6th Battalion Royal Australian Regiment, a force of 108 men, moves from the tall grass into a rubber plantation in Long Tan, South Vietnam. Commanding the company is one Major Harry Smith, a commando and all-round weapon of a man. He orders his men to spread out and get eyes on the enemy. After a recent shelling of the battalion's base at nearby Noi Dat, Smith expects that some 70 Viet Cong soldiers are at large in the plantation. What Smith doesn't know is that number is actually a lot higher. Lucky it would take nothing shy of the legions of hell to phase this man. One of Australia's greatest military leaders, whose coolness under pressure in the Battle of Long Tan was legendary. Let's get into it. Harry Arthur Smith was born in Hobart, Tasmania in July 1933, and war was definitely in his blood. His father was a World War II veteran who served in the 29 Armoured Regiment of the Australian Army, which fought in Borneo. In high school, he trained in the Cadet Corps and once got in trouble for stealing ammo from the machine gun range so he could pop rabbits with his 303 in his spare time, obliterating them with the high caliber rounds. After school, he started a career in metallurgy, but this ultimately didn't pan out. Under the Third National Service Scheme, Smith was required to undertake mandatory military training in which he climbed to the rank of corporal. When he came back, his former lab job was no longer available. He set metallurgy aside and joined the Australian Regular Army in May 1952. Over the next few years, Smith found himself a wife and participated in various military training programs, claiming his parachute wings at the Royal Australian Air Force Base in Williamtown, New South Wales. In his words, this was my first step into what was to become a career allied to parachuting and other special forces activities. In December 1955, Smith, a second lieutenant now, was deployed on Penang Island as a platoon commander in the Malayan emergency. He described it like this, the Malayan emergency was a daily routine of ambush, village food checks, security patrols and jungle patrols. In Singapore, a ways south of Penang, Smith added a month of jungle patrol training to his belt and then returned to Penang where his pregnant wife joined him for a time. According to Smith, she wasn't impressed with the situation. She gave birth to a girl while Smith was away at another base and Smith killed his first man in this conflict. When his deployment ended, he went to Sydney, had two more children with his wife, and then left them there so he could pursue a career in the military without any distractions. Smith trained with two commando company in Melbourne for a time, and then, in 1965, was posted to the 6th Battalion Royal Australian Regiment, or simply 6 RAR, near Brisbane, where they bumped him to the rank of Major and gave him command of Delta Company. 6 RAR had Vietnam in its sights, and Smith trained them up nice and good. The unit flew to Vietnam in June 1966 and set up shop at the task force base in Noi Dat. At 2am on the 17th of August, the Viet Cong shelled the base from a nearby rubber plantation. B Company searched the plantation first, but came back without having engaged the enemy. The following day, it was Delta Company that went out on the hunt. Shortly after entering the plantation, 8 Viet Cong walk into the midst of Delta Company's 11 platoon. A firefight breaks out and 10 platoon goes to 11's aid only to get pinned down themselves. Thinking fast, Smith orders 10 platoon back under the cover of 12 platoon. Both units take casualties and Smith realizes he isn't just dealing with 70 enemy soldiers. He would order a fighting withdrawal, but 11 platoon is still out there getting hammered among the rubber trees. 
Smith is a leader, and he knows what he has to do. Lead. He calls for artillery and air support and resupply by choppers. He radios B Company for reinforcement. And it is now that the sky decides to erupt, throwing a tropical monsoon into the mix. This nullifies his air support, but Smith learns that reinforcements, namely A Company, are on their way via armored personnel carriers instead. The remnants of Delta Company rally at a makeshift defensive position where they repel wave after wave of Viet Cong in the midst of what they will later learn is a Category 10 cyclone. The enemy sound boogles before every assault and literally climb over the muddy corpses of their many dead comrades to close their noose on the desperate Australians. The machine gun and rifle fire is deafening, coming from all around. White latex spews from the bullet holes in the trees, some of which are occupied by VC snipers. Friendly artillery hews chunks out of the earth right in front of Delta Company. There's no time to fear, and the day is getting on now. Orange trace rounds spit through the darkening, wind-bent plantation. Throughout it all, Smith keeps his cool, orchestrating a force of fewer than 100 Aussies against as many as 2,500 Viet Cong. With expert leadership, Smith was able to hold off the Viet Cong until reinforcements from both B and A Company arrived at around 7pm. Coming face to face with the high caliber machine guns of A Company's armored personnel carriers, the remnants of the Viet Cong force picked up their guts and ran away through the plantation. If the Australian reinforcements had come any later, Delta Company would have found themselves out of ammo and completely surrounded. In some cases, Smith's men were down to their very last mag. The casualty figures vary, with the lower estimates claiming 245 Viet Cong killed and 500 wounded, and the highest estimates claiming 800 killed and as many as 1,000 wounded. Many of these men fell prey to the 3,500 artillery shells 6 RAR tore up the battlefield with throughout the evening. The Viet Cong put these figures a lot lower, claiming as few as 30 killed. Conversely, Delta Company lost 17 lives, while a further 21 men were wounded. This amounted to over a quarter of the company's starting strength. Smith described the aftermath of the battle well. The enemy had obviously been so badly mauled that they could not muster a viable ambush on the APCs nor counterattack our positions, and just fled, leaving many of their dead. Then came the grisly task of burying them. It's also important to note that the Aussies estimated the Viet Cong starting force was between 1,500 and 2,500 men strong whereas the Viet Cong stated they had just 700 men in the fight. Both sides claimed to have won the Battle of Long Ten. For his absolute coolness under pressure, Smith was awarded the Military Cross. A section of the citation read, Throughout the action, he directed the fire of his company and of his supporting artillery batteries with such effectiveness that the enemy finally disengaged and withdrew. But for the determination and outstanding leadership shown by this officer, D Company might well have been annihilated. By August 1967, Smith went back to Australia and tried to put in a little more family time. His wife and three children quickly got sick of following him from military base to military base, however, so he left his wife. Smith continued his military training, which included practicing airborne and amphibious raids, and through this, he met another woman, whom he later married. In 1975, he was testing a new free-fall parachute when it failed to open, forcing him to resort to the reserve parachute. At this point, the main parachute opened and caused him to come to a sudden stop, during which his spine was damaged. Unfortunately, his injuries rendered him unfit for the field, so he left the military in March 1976. In 2019, Australian director Kriv Stenders released a film titled Danger Close, The Battle of Long Tan, in which Travis Fimmel, the dude who played Ragnar Lothbrok, played Smith. As far as we're aware, Harry Smith, an 88-year-old veteran, is still kicking it today. As always, we'd love to know what you think. Had you heard about Harry Smith before today? What about the bloody Thermopylae-like Battle of Long Tan? How many Viet Cong do you think there were? How many casualties do you think they took? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. It's 1965. A platoon of the Civilian Irregular Defense Group scours a rice paddy in Vietnam's Cha Bong Valley in the early afternoon sun. Two Australian warrant officers aid them in this endeavor. 
Their names are Swanton and Wheatley. The latter, Wheatley, is a short, stocky man whose courage and wild toughness no man doubts. The village of Binghua stands on the side of the valley ahead, almost peaceful, too peaceful it seems. The pop of an exploding cartridge shatters the relative silence. There's a great splash, and Wheatley turns to find one of his men on his back among the rice shoots. The village erupts. Swanson, who is trying to carry the downed man to safety, takes a bullet to the abdomen and goes down himself. The platoon takes what cover it can while Wheatley, huddled by a dying Swanton, radios first for the aid of a close by platoon and then for an airstrike and evac. Bullets tear at the fields. Wheatley's men perish all around him, their blood clouding through the shallows. Some begin to flee into the jungle, a 200 meter dash under heavy Viet Cong fire. A medic makes it clear to Wheatley. Swanson isn't going to make it. Wheatley should flee with his life while he can. But abandoning your mates is not the Australian way, not Wheatley's way, and he's willing to prove it, even if it costs him everything. We descend into the Vedant hell that was the Vietnam War to tell the tale of Australian Victoria Cross recipient Dasher Wheatley, whose deeds exemplified what Australian mateship is all about. As is customary, let's go back a few decades to Wheatley's birth. Kevin Arthur Wheatley was born in Surrey Hills, New South Wales in Australia 1937. He went to school in Maroubra and worked several labour intensive jobs when he left. It's unclear exactly when he started playing rugby union, but his short yet powerful stature paid off on the field, earning him the nickname Dasher. He married young, taking a 14 year old wife at the age of 17, which was apparently fine back in those days. In 1956, Wheatley joined the Australian Regular Army and, when he'd completed his training, served in various battalions of the Royal Australian Regiment. In September 1957, Wheatley got to put himself to the test, fighting for Australia and the Commonwealth in the Malayan Emergency. It's unclear exactly what he got up to in this conflict, but he was overseas until July 1959, about a year before the conflict came to an end. Wheatley enjoyed five odd years at a posting in Australia after that, during which time he was promoted to sergeant and then warrant officer. Events in Southeast Asia were probably at the back of his mind though. In March 1965, it came to the front. The Australian Army sent Wheatley to Vietnam to work for the Australian Army Training Team Vietnam or AATTV. This was a specialist unit of so-called military advisors raised to aid the South Vietnamese military. Almost 1,000 Australians served in the AATTV throughout the 10 years it was active. The unit earned more than 100 military decorations and suffered just 33 personnel killed. To begin with, Wheatley advised a unit of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam or ARVN. This was where his true bravery began to shine. In May 1965, Wheatley was fighting alongside a group of ARVN troops who had pinned down an enemy battalion. The crossfire was heavy though, and there were civilians in the area. Terrified, a young girl attempted to escape right through the middle of the battlefield. Wheatley didn't even hesitate. He ran into the crossfire, picked her up and used his body as a shield while he carried her to safety. Maybe not so different than he would have dashed with a rugby ball. In August that same year, he was working as an assistant advisor to an ARVN force assaulting a village overrun with enemy troops. They cleared the village and the enemy troops fled up a slope. Wheatley, unsatisfied with claiming merely the village, pursued them alone under a volley of small arms fire and grenades. His action inspired the ARVN troops to give chase and ultimately break the enemy force. In October, Wheatley was transferred to the so-called A-Team under the United States 5th Special Forces Group, Airborne, which was operating out of a base in the village of Chabong in Quang Nai Province. There was only one road in or out and the Viet Cong had severed it, so Wheatley arrived by air. Here, he teamed up with Warrant Officer Ron Butch Swanson to lead a platoon of the Civil Irregular Defense Group or CIDG, which was composed mostly of local Highland troops. One captain, Felix Fazekas, led a second platoon and Wheatley and Swanson answered to him. On the 13th of November, the platoon split up to undertake a search and destroy mission, 
believing Viet Cong were operating in the area. As we know, their intel was correct. Let's see how it plays out. Wheatley gives up on calling for air support and dumps his radio in the mud. He can't leave Swanton, but he can't stay here either. Hoisting Swanton from his feet, machine gun and rifle fire whizzing over his head, Wheatley half carries, half drags his wounded comrade over the rice paddies, heading for the jungle some 200 meters away. All of his training comes into play here, all those grueling battles on the rugby field. Against all odds, they make it to the comparative cover of the jungle, the Viet Cong hot on their tail. That's when one CIDG private by the name of Din Do emerges from the jungle, imploring Wheatley to abandon the doomed Swanton and save himself. Bullets rip through the fronds and splinter trees. Their enemies are close, within 10 meters. Wheatley looks at Din Do, shakes his head, and Din Do receives the message and flees, glancing over his shoulder just once. It is at this moment that he sees Wheatley pull the pins from two grenades and prepare a special welcoming party for the advancing Viet Cong. When the dust settles at first light the following morning, Din Do leads Captain Fazekas to the site where it all went down. Wheatley and Swanton lie in the understory, dead. Their bodies riddled with bullets, many fired at point-blank range. In the face of certain death, Wheatley didn't flinch. To him, leaving Swanton to die alone would have been a decision he couldn't live with, a fate worse than death. While there were some hiccups along the way, Wheatley was ultimately awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross for his bravery and sacrifice. The following is an excerpt from the citation. Warren Officer Wheatley displayed magnificent courage in the face of an overwhelming Viet Cong force which was later estimated at more than a company. He had the clear choice of abandoning a wounded comrade and saving himself by escaping through the dense timber or staying with Warren Officer Swanton and thereby facing certain death. He deliberately chose the latter course. His acts of heroism, determination and unflinching loyalty in the face of the enemy will always stand as examples of the true meaning of valor. With this, Wheatley became one of just four Australians who received the Victoria Cross for their actions in the Vietnam War. He also received three awards from the South Vietnamese and one from the Americans. These included the Knight of the National Order of Vietnam, the Military Merit Medal, the Cross of Gallantry with Palm, and the Silver Star, respectively. His wife and four children were still out of a husband and father though. Wheatley's body was returned to Australia and laid to rest in Pine Grove Memorial Park in New South Wales. His family donated his VC to the Australian War Memorial in Canberra in 1993. We'd love to know what you think though. Had you heard of Dasher Wheatley before today? Do you think his actions exemplified what Australian mateship was all about back then? Do you think it's still like that now or have things changed? Lastly, would you like us to cover more brave Australians from, well, any time and place? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.